Here's 17 things you missed in Departure, the 2011 Hunt Hunter anime opening. Given that this opening ran for almost 150 episodes straight, the production team made sure to utterly stuff it with enough detail that repeat viewings would be very rewarding. And even after watching it 148 times, there is definitely stuff you missed. So the very first thing you see in the Departure opening is Heaven's Arena. In fact, the first three Departure openings are sandwiched by Heaven's Arena content on both sides. We see it in the distance at the very beginning, and at the end, we've reached Gon confronting Hisoka. And the reason why Heaven's Arena gets used so much is because it's not just the physical destination we're working towards, and it's not just building up towards Gon's confrontation with Hisoka either. In the grand scheme of Hunter Hunter, that's almost a side trip. The reason why this building is ever present is because Heaven's Arena represents the true final stage of the Hunter exam, which is the secret Nen teaching phase. So even though it does feel a bit weird to always have Heaven's Arena in sight well, well before it becomes relevant, it represents what Gon, and in fact, what everyone else is working towards in the first 36 episodes. For the first few openings, the four protagonists are also accompanied by text, which is the language of the Hunt Hunter world. So in order to translate it, what you need to do is first need to translate that text into Japanese and then that Japanese into English. It's actually not that difficult because it's a very simplistic writing system that acts as a one-to-one -one replacement of hiragana. So no katakana and very importantly, no kanji. So that makes the Hunter Hunter language very friendly. And in the openings, these end up spelling the full names of the characters or at least the full ones of the ones we know. But even if you can't read Japanese or Hun, to Nanese, there is at least one letter that you'll recognize because if we look at Leorio's name, we see two circles. Now in English, this sort of circle, that would be an O, and in this language, it is also an O. Although evidently Japanese itself does exist in the Hunt Hunter world, as in the Chimera Antarch opening, Isaac Netero gets plastered with a nice big kanji, which can be read as either Shin or Kokoro, and has a wide array of meanings, including spirit, heart, mind, feelings, and mm, emotion. Essentially, this is the closest a single kanji can cover to covering the entire human experience, which is why Netero brands himself with it, marching into the extermination mission as a champion of humanity. And that's also why he gets stamped with the kanji in this opening. The kanji itself is also what the ants mainly struggle with during this arc. Netero isn't their toughest opponent, the humanity within the ants is. Also, this fictional hunter content is sponsored by Ugreen, the company that continues to specialize in making my life easier. Not just by sponsoring these videos, but by catering to my voracious power needs. In fact, this is the third time we've worked with Ugreen now and they keep sending me this stupidly useful stuff. So this time I have the honor of showing off the Nexode Pro 65 Watt Mini, as well as the Nexode Pro 65 Watt Cookie. The cookie in particular I love because it's so slim, unbelievably light, and it has two USB-C ports and one USB-A port. The USB-C one can provide 65 watts of charging power and it can charge a 13 inch MacBook Air from zero to 70% in 60 minutes. And the Mini can do exactly the same thing, just in a much more cuter, chunksome size. Both come equipped with Nexode's revolutionary Eperatec, combined with the latest GAN Infinity chip, which allows these bad boys to be as small as they are. So for example, I also have the much larger four port 160 watt option, which is also amazing. But more often than not, I find that these little guys get the job done just as well. And each of them can charge up to three devices at once, as well as be compatible with 45 watt Samsung super fast charging 2.0, which is fantastic for me because I run a production office with laptops, phones, earbuds, and camera batteries, just batteries for days, man. So I can never, ever, ever have enough of these. So you can and should check out my a link in the description to acquire these amazing devices and it directly supports the channel because it sponsors like you green that allow us to support our channel artists and editors and generally give us the power to bring you more content more regularly. So thanks again to you green, but for now it's back to you, me. But one of the things I love about the very first departure opening is that we get to see our four protagonists do exactly that. And within seconds, it tells you everything you need to know about them. Gon actually begins at the very last part of the first stage of the Hunter exam, but it symbolizes him feeling trapped on Whale Island and having the whole world open up to him as he exits the tunnel. Karapika is running through a very natural environment because he grew up in the natural wonderland that was the Luxo province. It's, uh, it's not so great anymore. And you've got Leoria running through a miscellaneous slum town. They're always very hard to distinguish from one another because Togashi has this very established slum style that he falls back on. But the reason why he's in this environment is because Leoria grew up in poverty. And he even had a friend die because he couldn't afford surgery that would have saved his life. So Leorio, he's leaving all of this behind to pursue both wealth and medicine to ensure that this never happens again. And then we see Killua skating away from Heaven's Arena, which is interesting because that's the destination that everyone else is portrayed as running towards. So this casts Killua as the more experienced one because this is the destination that everyone else in the opening is running towards, but one that Killua has already comfortably conquered 
to the point where he can just casually skate away from it. And it's very funny because literally the next shot is all four protagonists running towards Heaven's Arena. So from Killua's perspective, he's skating away and then he sees his friends and it's all like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going back. But going back to Karapika's departure though, there's a lot more here than most people realizing, including me. This was actually pointed out to me by a channel called Sash Mash, which sadly I don't think is active anymore. But this channel made an amazing video dissecting departure from a musical perspective, a link to which is in the description. And one small thing Sash Mash lingered on is Karapika running into the falling green leaves. Falling leaves is a very common piece of imagery to indicate death. The month of autumn or fall for our American friends is historically known as a time of dying and rising. Hence why in say Catholicism, they celebrate both All Saints Day and All Souls Day in autumn. One celebrates the souls that have reached the heaven and one celebrates the souls that have departed but have not yet reached the heaven, I think. I'm not Catholic, that's what Google said. So the tone is somber but celebratory. However, in Karapika's case, this comes with a particularly painful twist because he's running into falling green leaves, green generally meaning alive and can thus symbolize a premature death. And he's running into a whole lot of them. One might even say that there's an entire clan of leaves representing his slaughtered Kurta brethren. And you know what? You could also view it as Karapika symbolically running prematurely towards his own death because he's going into the leaves. Because from the very commencement of Hunt Hunter until the conclusion of York New, Karapika considers his life more or less forfeit. The only reason why he exists at this stage is to kill the Phantom Troop. And one painfully minor touch that I also love is that Karapika is frowning the whole time whilst running, which is then directly juxtaposed against Leorio, running with a big old grin on his face. I love it because it shows how each of them have decided to deal with their respective grief. Karapika, he's chosen the path of causing more pain, so much more pain, whilst Leorio is doing his best to transform his ordeal into something positive. But after watching this opening roughly a gazillion times, one of the things that makes me laugh is the part where Killua steps in to defeat all of the enemies in front of Gon. The first one is dispatched with a really cool and rather painful kick to the back of the head, but the other guy has a much weirder fate because if you look very carefully, what Killua does is playfully kick him in the elbow and it sends him flying so, so far. It's just a piece of choreography that I find interesting that probably no one else does. Like Killua just does this, this dainty kick and the guy gets hit in the elbow and he's like, ah, I'm flying away. But look, I do personally pay a lot of attention to Killua in these openings because for most of them, you can tell the entire story through his eyes alone. In the first departure, he pops in and his eyes are immediately fixated on Gon. And when they're both running down Heaven's Arena, there's this super quick but split second of Killua looking towards Gon and making sure that he's having fun as well. Then at the end of the Greed Island opening, you've got both Gon and Killua looking at each other, which is a big step forward because this is the strongest their friendship gets. As opposed to the end of the Chimera Antark opening, where not only is Killua not looking at Gon for the first time, but they're both facing away from each other because they're going down very different paths. Out of context, it does look quite statuesque and stoic, as if they're both determined to see this through, and they are, but each of them has a very different idea of how this situation needs to play out. And so the two of them can no longer see eye to eye. And then in the final opening, Gon and Killua aren't even on screen together at all, except for right at the beginning, where you see Gon walking away from Killua and his focus then shifts to Alaka, who becomes his new companion from this point onwards. For such a cold, brutal assassin man, Killua's eyes alone express so much more emotion than almost any other character as a whole. And I think that the openings did a brilliant job of utilizing that, as well as many other things, because visual language is everything. In the first opening, there's a brief montage of three groups that we encounter during the Hunter exam. The first First is Hisoka and Illumi, and they look incredibly intimidating because the camera is looking up at them. They occupy a higher plane of existence than us and they aren't even looking straight at us. Half of their faces are also obscured as if they're not particularly concerned with our presence. And of course, they're draped in delightful dark purple, which is one of the more spiritual colors indicating wisdom or divinity. But also dark purple in particular is used to indicate an obstacle to be overcome. Then we move to a group shot of the other hunter exam candidates and they immediately look far less intimidating because they're all looking at the camera flat on, and most of them are also meeting our eyeline. All in all, they're not too much to be worried about. However, they're set against a red, and this paints them as the most immediate danger. The biggest danger is Hisoka and Illumi. They're the ones that ultimately we need to keep an eye on and be worried about. But these lesser dangers are the most immediate threat. They're the ones currently going for our throats, so we need to give them attention as well. And finally, we have the set of examiners, who, like Hisoka and Illumi, are also looking down on the camera, especially Netro, who's perched on a communications tower, which represents the gulf between the chairman and even seasoned hunters. Because the Tots, Menchi, and Buhara, they're all meant to be looked up to, but they're meant to be presented as achievable. But overall, this group is assigned yellow, which is the color of idealism, imagination, optimism, hope,
rope and all of the other good words, and also some of the bad ones like hazards, which the examiners definitely are. It's not their job to not kill you if that makes sense. Now, the first time we see the Phantom Troop is opening too, and they're covered in a collage that forms from the top down, ending with Crollo at the very bottom. And this is really cool visual language because generally you'll find that in anime when showcasing enemies like this, there's this tendency to put the leader at the top. But the fact that Crollo is on the bottom creates an image where he quite literally has the rest of the Phantom Troop on his shoulders, which he metaphorically does as their leader. It says that they mean something to him and that Crollo does feel the weight of their lives as opposed to them being minions to prop up his evil empire. Then in the third opening, we have a very cool montage of the troop using their abilities. One small detail I like is that we get a glimpse of Finks using Ripper Cyclotron long, long before he actually uses it in the series. But the only troop member who doesn't get a showcase is Uvaking, who has a solo shot accompanied by the lyrics, you can smile which if you didn't know any better, would paint Uvagin as the tragic protagonist because he's lit by these beautiful, pristine rays of light. And so it makes you think that he's someone who fell in battle making a noble sacrifice. And I guess from the perspective of the Phantom Troop, that's exactly what he did. And I just find it really interesting that this moral ambiguity gets incorporated into openings because it shows that the production team have put a lot of thought into this. To someone who doesn't know Hunter x Hunter, this could very easily be a compilation of protagonists, protagonists attacking in the name of their fall and brother. And this sort of respect continues very much into the fourth opening where we see a group shot of the Phantom Troop standing on a symbol that you may or may not immediately recognize, but it's the cross-shaped tattoo on Crollo's forehead. Now Crollo himself as always carries quite a bit of religious symbolism in Hunter x Hunter, which I think this opening reflects perfectly. Because despite Crollo's absence from the troop, you have this shot of his disciples standing proudly on his symbol to carry on his ideals. Every tiny part of these openings are thought out almost beyond reasonable belief. Such as the end of opening four, where there's a nice shot of all the Greed Island gear with what looks like an assortment of random cards dropped on the table. But even these cards have been meticulously chosen. So three cards in particular, you've got Map of the Island, Peak and Sword of Truth, all of which are geared towards revealing and or obtaining information, which is the entire reason why Gon is on Greed Island. He's on a quest to find information about his father. That's why these cards hold more weight than the others, which are flipped around because we're disregarding them. But the other visible card is my favorite Greed Island card card rock, which is just a simple rock in card form. And it might seem arbitrary, but it's absolutely intentional because rock is the first Nen ability that Gon develops during this arc. To the ants now. Something that's always stood out to me about the Chimera Ant arc opening is the beginning where we have Meruem underwater, rising to the surface and eventually above the planet itself. And I believe this is to mimic the path of human evolution because we started out as aquatic organisms as well. But in Meruem's case, he goes straight from water to above the planet, which represents how rapidly he evolved beyond the human species. And when we first see the Royal Guard, they get introduced in the order in which they were born, but they end up occupying very interesting spaces in the shot where they bow to Meruem. You've got Shiapoof in the background, whose expression is the hardest to make out, and ultimately he's the most untrustworthy one and furthest away from the king's ideology. Second furthest physically away is Yupi, who's a step closer to Meruem, but nowhere near as close as Pito, who is on level ground and was always perfectly in sync with the king's desires. So this image shows your varying planes of loyalty. Each of the Royal Guard were fiercely loyal, but Yupi and Shiapoof were a few steps removed. In the final opening, we're treated to a montage of the Zodiacs who seem like they're arranged in random groups, but they're ordered chronologically according to the Chinese Zodiac animals. For example, the first four animals are rat, ox, tiger, and rabbit, also known as Pariston, Mizai Storm, Kanzai, and Pion. And finally, the ending of the last opening is the only one that doesn't feature Gon in the closing shot. Instead, it ends with Jing on top of the world tree, symbolizing that Gon's story has, for all intents, and purposes concluded and that we're moving on to something new, which is further symbolized by Gon passing on the license, which was the inciting object for the entire series. And that's 17 things that you probably missed in the Hunter x Hunter openings.